Together now every 
need a burden too long on my own I wasn't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let What a blessing it is to worship with you today. My name is Justin and I serve as the online discipleship pastor. Recently, we celebrated our rooted graduates who completed a 10 week small group experience where they got connected to God, the church and their purpose. This last session was our largest winter rooted ever with more than 1300 people 
Through your generosity, we're able to create opportunities like Rooted for people to hear the good news of Jesus and take courageous steps of faith, including many of you from our online community. Cynthia lives in Ensenada, Mexico, and signed up to join an online Rooted women's group. Through the course of the 10 weeks, she faithfully logged on and connected with the other women in her group who lived miles away from her. Her leader saw her heart for Jesus and her community and nominated her to serve as the group's life group leader. Now she's excited to jump into serving and continue building life-giving relationships with the others, all while living in a different country from most of her group. We're excited to see how God will continue to move and work in people's lives as they go deeper in community and grow in their faith. When you give to Mariners, you are actively a part of creating spaces like Rooted, where people experience transformation and the love of Jesus. You can text the number below to give now or tap give in the Mariners app. Thank you for being part of what Jesus is doing through our church. If you've never been through Rooted, now is the time. I wanna invite you to join us for the next session of Rooted launching the week of April 16th. We have online groups available by time zone so that you can experience this 10 week journey of getting connected to God, the church, and your purpose with others from our online community. You can sign up now for Rooted Online or any of our congregations through the link below. Today, we're launching our brand new series, What Would Jesus Say? Jesus had conversations with people from all walks of life, unbelieving skeptics, rigid rule followers, greedy business leaders, prostitutes, people suffering, and his words still speak to us today. We don't have to wonder what Jesus would say because we have what he said. I am excited to dive into scripture with you. You can follow along with sermon notes in the Mariners app, which you can download through the link below. Now, let's join Christine Kane for today's message. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Kane, and I have the privilege of being one of the teaching pastors right here at Mariners. And it's so good to be with our Mariners online congregation today. Now, I am excited to kick off our brand new series called What Would Jesus Say? Question mark where we will be looking at lots of different conversations that Jesus had with all different types of people in the Gospels. So today, we're going to look at what Jesus would say to someone who has been suffering for 38 years. And I think you might just be a little bit surprised at Jesus's pastoral care strategy. I know it took me by surprise. So would you turn with me today to the Gospel of John chapter 5, verses 1 to 16? Now, the Bible says after this, a Jewish festival took place and Jesus went up to Jerusalem by the sheep gate in Jerusalem. There is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, He said to him, do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. He replied, the man who made me well told me pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you pick up your mat and walk? They asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. After this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews began persecuting Jesus. He was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now, this story is set in the city of Jerusalem where where Jesus had gone to observe what most commentators agree was probably the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, at this time in history, 
The Jewish males in Judea were required to attend three festivals every year. And these were the festival of Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. And Jesus, being a Jewish man, would have faithfully observed these festivals. Now, he specifically entered the city by the sheep gate, which was where the shepherds would drive their sheep into Jerusalem so they could go right to the pool of Bethesda and wash their sheep. Now, this pool was divided into by a wall and the people washed on one side and the sheep on the other. Now, listen, I'm a germaphobe, so I've got to admit that I'm personally really grateful for modern plumbing and definitely for separate washrooms. Now, in Hebrew, the pool of Bethesda means house of mercy, and in Aramaic, it means house of grace. So we know by the name of the pool that it's a special place where people came to find mercy and grace. Now, there were five porches around the sides of the pool, as the text states, and there were a large number of disabled and blind and lame and paralyzed people that were gathered on these porches, and and they were desperately hoping to be healed. Now, it's important to remember that in these times, people with disabilities were pushed to the margins of society and they, they were excluded from the religious and the cultural life that their society had, partly because it was commonly believed back then that sickness and disability were punishments for sin. So right at the outset of this message, I wanna be very clear right from the start that in no way do we believe that disability is the result of sin. And I would never want to underestimate or undermine the difficulty or the pain or the frustration of living with a disability or severe illness. So at all times, we must remember that God is sovereign and a lack of healing does in no way show that it's an evidence of a lack of faith. So I want to get back to the text now and find out why these people gathered on the porches around the pool of Bethesda, because it seems like a really strange thing to do. Well, they did this because this particular pool was fed by an underground spring and it overflowed, it would bubble up from beneath and cause the waters to stir up on the top. Now, legend has it that this rippling effect of the waters was caused by the fluttering of angels' wings. And so the first person to enter the water would be healed. Now, nobody knew exactly when this would happen but they would gather there daily and they would be hoping they they would be the right person in the right place at the right time and that they would be the ones that would get healed. So could you just imagine how frustrating and how disappointing it would be lying there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, just hoping and just praying that you might have the chance to be the first one to get in the pool. Well, on this particular day, when Jesus visited the pool, he fixed his gaze on one man. Now picture this, he was surrounded by a large number of people, but he went to the one. I want you to know that Jesus cares about the one. He was frequently surrounded by large crowds in his ministry, but he was always interested in the one. Today, you might feel like you're just part of a large crowd, but I want you to know that Jesus sees you right where you are and that he cares about you that you matter to God, that your needs matter to God, that your concerns matter to God. So when Jesus approached this man who'd been lying there for a long time and had been disabled for 38 years, he asked him a question that literally shocked me. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? Now listen, you have to admit, on the surface, this sounds somewhat insensitive. This is definitely not what we're taught to do here in pastoral care at Marinus Church. In fact, I think Pastor Eric might recommend that we look for another job. If any of the pastoral team here asks someone in this condition, do you want to get well? This question, it just kind of seems to lack empathy or compassion. But in fact, I want you to know, it's a profound question to ask on so many different levels. By looking directly at the man and asking him this question, Jesus is actually recognizing and he's acknowledging the personhood of a man that most people walk straight past and ignored. He's actually giving this man agency and choice and perhaps for the very first time in his life, Jesus is asking this man if he's willing to be made well or or to be made whole. Now by asking him if he's willing, Jesus is actually saying, you can participate in this healing process by being willing to receive something that's gonna radically change your life. Now, I've discovered that in life, you and I can wish for things to be different. But if we're not willing to do what it takes to change them, then things will stay the same. 
Now, if we want to change, then we've got to ask ourselves if we're really willing to perhaps give up a particular way of life. Uh, are we really willing to move on from a particular group of people? Are we willing to go through rehab if necessary? Are we willing to go to marriage counselling to save our marriage? Are we willing to go back to school? Are we willing to change our spending habits? Are we willing to step out from the familiar to the unfamiliar? Are we willing to let go of our bitterness or our anger or our unforgiveness or our greed or hurt or rejection? The question is, do we really want to be made well more than anything else on earth? Now, the truth is, that there are many times Jesus invites us into deeper levels of healing and wholeness, but we're unwilling to do what it takes to have it. There are times where it just seems easier to be accepted or affirmed or comforted or enabled or, or pitied and basically just stay in our brokenness or our dysfunction rather than to be transformed or changed by the healing power of Jesus. So Jesus was actually asking this man, do you really want it? Now, I have to admit, I was even more surprised by this man's response to Jesus than I was by Jesus's question to this man. I would have thought this man would have responded with like a a resounding yes. I would have thought he would have shouted yes. After 38 years, I do want to be made well. Can you make me well right now? But instead of a yes, this man gave Jesus two reasons as to why it was impossible for him to be made well. Now, I just want you to picture this for a moment. Standing in front of him was the healer himself, but the man was so tied to his excuses that he couldn't even see Jesus for who he really was. So firstly, he said, there's no one to put him in the pool. And secondly, he said that someone always got in there before him and that he was the one that always missed out. So the man basically was blaming others for his condition. He was claiming it's not his fault that he wasn't well. So truth be told, I think we've all gotten into the blame game at some time or another in our lives, haven't we? I know I have. We believe that we're not well or we're not whole because of what someone else has said to us or what someone else has done to us or even what someone didn't say to us or didn't do for us. So what happens is we we stay on the proverbial mat of life blaming life or blaming politics or a lack of opportunity or the economy or our background or whatever else comes to mind. We miss the very fact that Jesus is right here with us, offering us a life beyond our past, beyond our excuses, beyond our pain. And by focusing on our excuses, we can end up missing Jesus and the healing that He's got for each and every one of us. Listen, there's not one person or one situation that is worth wasting 38 years of your life lying on a proverbial mat. What Jesus did for us on the cross at Calvary is greater than what anyone has done to us or what anyone has said about us. So let's give more power to Jesus than to people or our past or our circumstances. I wonder today, is there any area in your life where Jesus is inviting you to be made well, but you're not even hearing that invitation anymore because perhaps in your past there's been disappointment or failure. And the fact is when we often abandon our desire to be made well or to be made whole, then the reality of our life ends up being a whole lot less than we expected. You know, when we stop believing God for healing or for breakthrough, and we go through the motions of life, never really expecting anything from God so that we won't be disappointed. I've got to imagine that this man's response to Jesus was the result of years and years of disappointment and decades of waiting and losing all hope. He no longer believed anything would change for him. He had simply accepted that this was his lot in life. He accepted the mat as his destiny. So I've got to tell you today, church, that I certainly understand how this man ended up feeling that he was helpless, that his life was hopeless and that there was no future for him. I personally could have easily ended up living my life on the proverbial mat of defeat and despair because of my background. As many of you know, I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted when I was born. I was the victim of 
childhood sexual abuse for many years and I was marginalised because of my ethnicity and growing up in Sydney, Australia. It was, it was just a real negative. So for a long time, I truly thought I had to live my life as a, a victim of my circumstances. Now, of course, what happened to me was so wrong and it impacted me greatly. But when I started to make what Jesus did for me in my life greater than what anyone else had done to me, then I have to tell you, church life started to change. I discovered that through the power of the Holy Spirit, I actually had more agency than I ever thought. I didn't have to spend my one and only life on this earth blaming everyone else for the fact that so many traumatic things happened to me. But because of the blood of Jesus that was shed at Calvary, I could have a life beyond my past and what happened to me. Jesus came to not only save me, but to heal me and to deliver me from the things that kept me on the mat of life. You know, if I remained on that mat of blame or victimhood or shame, Jesus would not have loved me any less than He does right now. But you know what would have happened? I would have missed so many things that He had for me on the other side of my healing. Now, if I was still on my mat, there would be no 821, today we rescue the victims of human trafficking. We have, you know, 20 officers in 15 countries around the world. And we have seen thousands of victims rescued, hundreds of millions of people reached with prevention and awareness campaigns. And we've seen hundreds and hundreds of traffickers be sentenced and and convicted and, and be put in prison. Well, none of that would have happened if I'd be lying on that mat. Would Jesus love me any less? Of course not. But I'd still be lying on that mat. There would be no propel women, or nor would I be here as a teaching pastor at this wonderful church speaking to you today. I wouldn't be writing any books or, or teaching around the globe. You know, I've got to ask the question, who knows how much Jesus has for you on the other side of your willingness to say, I want to be made well. The question for all of us today is always, do you want to get well? It starts with us being willing to be made well or made whole. Now, did you notice? Jesus did not even acknowledge the man's excuses. He simply said, get up, pick up your mat, literally like he goes, get up, pick up your mat and walk. I mean, didn't Jesus just hear what this man said? Didn't he care about this man's excuses? Now, of course, Jesus cared about this man. And precisely because he wanted the best for him, he bypassed all the conversation concerning why he ended up on the mat and offered him the healing that he was so desperate for. You know, he would not have been by the pool if he didn't want to be healed. Why would he be there every day? He was there because he wanted what only Jesus could give him. So Jesus told him to do what he actually could not do. Jesus told him to get up and change his perspective. Now, It would have taken so much faith for this man to do what Jesus told him to do. Remember, he had been lying there for 38 years. He didn't think he could get up. Imagine the atrophy in his muscles. But this is the deal. Faith requires action. He had to be obedient to what Jesus told him to do, even when it didn't make rational sense. Even when it might have sounded a little bit harsh or unloving. You know, sometimes as parents, we do that with our kids and they don't think they can do it. And we want to draw the best out of them. So we'll push them beyond what they think they can do. Sometimes we have to do what we don't think we can do by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in the healing and wholeness that Jesus Christ offers us. You know, Jesus did not accommodate this man in his self-pity, but he actually challenged him to get up when this man had not walked on his own two feet for almost four decades. Jesus came to him right where he was, right there on the mat by the pool of Bethesda, but he didn't leave him in the same state or the same place that he found him. He not only told the man to get up, but he then exhorted him to pick up, to pick the mat up and to carry the very thing that had been carrying him. You know, I wonder today, I wonder if Jesus might be challenging you today to do something 
you didn't think you could do so that you can begin to walk in the freedom that he has for you. You know, at A21, we host an annual walk for freedom and we have over 520 walks in, you know, um, countries in 46 countries around the world, over 100,000 people walk. But what amazes me about this is that because all of those decades ago, I chose to get up, I chose to pick up my proverbial mat and follow Jesus and to receive his healing, hundreds of thousands in hundreds of cities around the world are walking for freedom for those that are still caught in captivity. So I'm saying this today because I want you to imagine and and have a physical picture of what happens spiritually when you decide to receive Jesus's invitation to be made well, when you're willing to go through the pain and discomfort to get up, to pick up your proverbial mat and to start walking, I want you to know it impacts every person in your sphere of influence and your entire future. You don't know how many others will walk and pick up their own mat and step into their God-given purpose because you chose to get up, to pick up your mat and to walk. You know, the scripture says that instantly the man got well, picked up his mat and started to walk. You know, I love that in this particular case, the man was instantly healed. Everyone in his world knew that he had been disabled for 38 years. And you would think that the entire community would be ecstatic that a bona fide miracle had happened in their midst. I mean, you'd think they'd be having a party and they'd be trying to find out more about who this man Jesus was. But you know what? Instead of rejoicing, the religious leaders were indignant that the man had been healed on the Sabbath. Now they were more concerned with the fact that the man picked up his mat on the Sabbath when the law prohibited this than they were about the fact that a dude who had been disabled for almost four decades was healed. I mean, it's actually unbelievable. Can you see, church, how legalism blinds us sometimes to who Jesus actually is and to his miracle working power? What you will discover is that in the culture in which we live, not everyone is excited about the prospect of you being made well or whole. Sometimes people are a lot more comfortable with you when you're in your broken state than they are when you're healed and whole. So often our own wholeness threatens other people because it confronts them to have to deal with their own dysfunction or their own brokenness. Emotionally unhealthy people really don't like to hang out with healthy people. So in this case, the Pharisees lost sight of Jesus and the miracle he just performed because they were so worked up that this happened on the Sabbath. It actually gets a little crazier because later on, they begin persecuting Jesus because he was healing people on the Sabbath. Can you imagine how spiritually blind these religious leaders were? How hard-hearted you'd have to be to miss the wonder of the miracle and all the implications that it has for someone's life and future because you're so caught up on the fact that a rule had been broken. You know, I wonder how many potential miracles we might miss out on seeing because we put God in a box and we've decided when and how God can do certain things. You know, a really beautiful part of this story is that the next time Jesus found this man was when the man was in the temple. I don't want you to skip over this fact because it's so important. Now imagine that for almost four decades, this man never had access to the temple. People like him, they were on the margins. They were discarded. They were not included. They were never involved in the religious or the cultural life of their society. But now that he had been healed, he had access to places where he had never been permitted to enter before. So I just wanna make the point that healing and wholeness give us access to new opportunities. They open up whole new doors and a whole new future for us. I find that the more I respond to Jesus's invitation for deeper healing, the more doors of opportunity open up for me in life. You just never know what God has for you on the other side of your healing. When Jesus spoke to the man in the temple, he he said something that again would not necessarily win him many friends in the 21st century. He said to the man, 
See, you will. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. So Jesus is reminding the man that he is now well and he's living an entirely different life to the one he once lived. He's now participating in his community and certainly flourishing compared to when he was lying on his mat by the pool of Bethesda. Jesus then tells the man to sin no more so that nothing worse happens to him, which shows which shows us that Jesus certainly did not encourage or dismiss or ignore sin in any way. He didn't say to the man, you're well now, so go do whatever you wanna do, whenever you wanna do it with whoever you wanna do it with. Jesus knew that sin would destroy his wellness and his wholeness and that it has eternal ramifications. So without doubt, there, there are two things that will keep you on the mat in your life. One is legalism, because let me tell you, Legalists don't want you to thrive and flourish in life because basically it just threatens their sense of control. But the other thing that will keep you on the proverbial mat of life is thinking that you've just got a license to sin, that you can just live what you think is your best life without any regard for God or His Word or His standards as He shows us in this Word. You know, very few things will get you back on the mat quicker than disregarding God's moral and ethical standards for our lives. Jesus doesn't only want us to be made well, He wants us to stay well and to run our race and to finish our course. That's why He's given us the beauty of His Word. So today, I I wanna leave you with a question. Jesus asked the man by the pool, do you want to get well? I also wanna remind you that your answer to this question has got ramifications, not just for you, but for the generations that are going to come after you. You know. I was preaching in Bedworth, England, uh, you know, a few years ago, and it, it's not, it's driving distance from another town called Stratford upon Avon. Now, of course, that's where William Shakespeare lived and wrote all of his uh, poems and, and all of his plays. And I'm a Shakespeare major. I studied that at the University of Sydney. And so I was pumped that I was so close to Willie's house. You know, when you're living in Australia, England's a long way. So I thought, I'm going to drive over to Willie's house. So I went over to Stratford-upon-Avon and I parked outside of Willie's house, but he wasn't home because, you know, he had died a few hundred years before, but he wasn't home. And I went and visited it. And across the road from Willie's house at that time, there was like a genealogy uh, shop where you could go in and you could put your last name into a computer and it would spit out your genealogy. Now, of course, my maiden name was Cariophilus, very nice Greek name, Christine Cariophilus. My married name is Cain because my husband is number 14 of 15 Cain children. I don't need to tell you anymore. He comes from very good English, Irish stock. I was so pumped when I went there because I thought maybe my husband, Nick, has been holding out on me. You know, Nick might come from British royalty. You know, I was watching The Crown at the time. I was thinking maybe I've got my own Downton Abbey and maybe I'm going to get an invitation to the royal wedding. This is going to be awesome. And Nick has not told me that we are part of, you know, maybe knights or barons or anyway. I put in the name Cain. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for knights, barons, you know, that maybe we've got going to have some special, beautiful castle somewhere in England. And when it spits out the paper on the list, it's got Nick's genealogy and then it's got pirates, convicts, criminals, murderers, thieves. I started bursting out laughing because there I thought I was going to get my own like Downton Abbey mansion. And I end up with like, that's how we ended up in Australia, you know, like convicts and criminals and thieves. And as I was walking down the street in Stratford-upon-Avon, I was holding this piece of paper and I thought, wow, this is a good bloodline. I married well, didn't I? I was, I was laughing, thinking I'm going to tell my daughters. And then I started thinking about my own. And of course, I don't even know truly all of my biological background, but I do know that there was immorality and there was abuse and there was addiction and there was unfaithfulness and infidelity and there was just so much bitterness and unforgiveness. And I just was walking down the street and I thought, wow, there is nothing Nick and I can do to change the past. Nick's got a past with pirates and convicts and criminals and thieves. And over here, we've got abuse and divorce and addiction and infidelity and unfaith. We can't change that past. 
But when my kids look at their genealogy and although they're going to look at those roots on the family tree and they can't change any of that, it is what it is. Because Nick and I, by the grace of God, because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ at Calvary, decided to get off the proverbial map in our life. Our kids are going to read, man, 30th of January, 1996, Nicholas Kane marries Holy Ghost terrorist, Christine Kane. And all of a sudden they're going to see that something shifted because Nick and I decided when we came together that we drew a bloodline in the sand and we said, you know what, with us, with us, abuse stops. With us, divorce stops. With us, addiction stops. With us, bitterness stops and unforgiveness stops. And with us, crime and violence and pain, it all stops. And it didn't just change us, but it changes the generations that are to come after us. So the future is different for our daughters because we made a decision. We are not just gonna sit on the mat and play the blame game and say, well, addictions have always been in our family. Abuse has always been in our family. Bitterness and unfaithfulness and unforgiveness. No, no, no. We made a decision when Jesus said, do you want to be made well? Pick up your mat and walk. We picked it up, not just for us, but for the generations that are going to come after us. Can I encourage you today? We can't change the past, but the blood of Jesus, although it doesn't give us amnesia, it gives us a life beyond our past into the future that God has for us today. Would you pick up your mat and walk, not just for you, but for the generations, biological and spiritual, that are to come in the future in Jesus' Name. You know, church, today, as we respond in worship, we got an opportunity to stand together in prayer for one another. So if you have any need in a lot of what I shared today from the Word of God, then I encourage you, would you please text prayer to the number on your screen? And our team would love to pray with you. Why don't we worship together right now?
streets yeah jesus in the darkness over every enemy we sing together jesus for my family i speak the holy name jesus Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, would you hold out your hands wherever you are and receive this blessing as you go? Heavenly Father, these are your children and they love you. Would you remind them of your nearness in every trial and hardship? Would you give them confidence about their future as they place their trust in you today? Would you give them the peace that only you can provide? Lord, I pray your blessing and wisdom upon each person. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.